Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. Today's presenter is Dr. Aaron Coe. His topic is The Laws of Health and Ancient Insights. It's good to see everyone here this morning. And um, today I'm going to talk about health laws and ancient insights. Well, because I'm going to share some ancient insights about not only the health, but also the Bible, we'd like to invite the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. If I can invite you to bow your heads and pray with me this morning. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the Sabbath day. We thank you that we can come before you today on this Saturday, that you've given us sunshine, You've given us great weather, and you've given us your message. Father, today we ask that you be with us. Help us to open our hearts and our minds to receive what you're about to teach us today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Peter has asked a bit about uh, myself. I'm just going to introduce maybe a bit more about myself. Um, I, I came from Singapore, and, um, and I came to Australia to further my studies. I graduated from Monash University to pursue medicine, and I had an interest in surgery, in particularly plastic surgery, but not the plastic surgery that we think about. I'm interested in the, in the hands, the microsurgery. And I enrolled myself in the Melbourne University and did a diploma of surgical anatomy. And um, I went to the Royal College of Surgeons in England, I went to Singapore to do microsurgery. And as what Peter has asked me, something changed my mind is I saw a great need in our health today and that's not plastic surgery but that's lifestyle medicine and um, I enrolled myself in a member of the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine I'm also a member of American College of Preventive Medicine and I'm also associate director of uh, New Netley's anxiety and depression program as you can see that um, I have this passion for lifestyle medicine because I have witnessed the change in people's lives and that drives me today. And today I'm going to share with you some of the insights uh, about health. But it's good that we are in Melbourne today because, you know, Melbourne for seven years straight was named the most livable city in the world. But this year in 2008, we lost it. We lost it. Why did we lose it? Well. In order to obtain the most livable city in the world, the Global Livable Index look at a few things. They look at the culture, they look at the education, they look at the environment, they look at the infrastructure of the city itself, and they look at crime and look at terrorism, and as well as healthcare. While well, Vienna was the most livable city in 2018, and they Mel Vienna and Melbourne topped the points for healthcare, but they lost. Melbourne lost because of one thing. It was the improved stability. Perhaps if we stop changing prime ministers, we may be the first livable city in the world. Well, we have one of the best healthcare in Australia, in Melbourne. We have more than 200 hospital outpatients and inpatients across regional Victoria and we have excellent follow-up outpatient services. So we are indeed very blessed with healthcare system in Melbourne. And in fact, one of the pioneering things that we can actually say about Melbourne is that we have one thing unique. We have a world-class pioneering stroke unit. It's only one of three countries that we have a mobile stroke response unit in Australia. Stroke is a devastating disease. It affects a lot of people. There's two kinds of stroke. One of them is a bleeding stroke, but 80% of people who suffer from stroke results from a clot that comes either from the heart or from the carotid arteries. And we know in stroke, time is brain tissue. And the mobile stroke unit of Royal Melbourne Hospital says with a stroke, every minute counts. And the best way to treat patients faster is to bring the hospital to the patient. Now, how are they going to do that? Well, we have the mobile stroke unit. What you see here is the inside of a specialized 
Ambulance. It's fully equipped, custom-built custom Specialist Ambulance Victoria that comes with a CT scan. It allows the imaging of the brain before the patient actually reach the hospital itself. And the team basically consists of two paramedics, one neurologist, one stroke nurse specialist, as well as a radiographer. And what it aims to do is when someone calls and that someone has a stroke, they will dispatch the mobile unit to the house, transport the patient into the ambulance, and they will start doing the scan there. And if they find that the patient has a, has a stroke, they will administer medication to try and dissolve the, clo the stroke, the, the clot in the brain, and transfer the patient as quickly as possible to the hospital. Every 10 minutes, there's someone who suffers from a stroke. Five billion dollars has been invested in the Australian healthcare for stroke. 6.1 million people suffer from high cholesterol. And do you know that one in two Australians suffer from chronic diseases? And while it's heroic to have a mobile stroke unit, and I do not doubt that it saves lives because my wife works in the stroke unit and he, she saw it firsthand, the people that has been saved and the outcome has been great. But the question is, in my mind, is how do we get to the people before they have the stroke? And that is the question that we're trying to solve today. Well, we have much to learn about ancient Egypt. And um, in the times where, in its time, its medical knowledge is profound. It was at that time where it was the forefront of, of medicine. And what they have discovered in, the, in Egypt, not too long ago, they found the papyrus, the Ebers papyrus, among other papyrus. And they dated to about 1,500 1, BC. And that's about three and a half thousand years ago. And what they discovered was fairly amazing. That they found that they were at the forefront of, of, of their time in terms of different specialties of surgery, pharmacology, obstetrics, and among other things. Hippocrates, also named the father of medicine, and he, he himself was educated in Egypt, as well as Galen as well. And they found that the Bible tells us about Egypt's medical practice in the book of Jeremiah as well. Egyptian medical practice contains many fields that I've talked about. And um, they were the forefront, they were able to do a lot of things that other countries could, were not able to do. What can we learn from them? Dr. Dr. Rosalie David, she's uh, one of the pioneers of e Egyptology in studying mummy. In fact, she received the OBE award, the Order of the British Empire, for the research that she has done. And she was from Man Manchester University, and she has studied mummies. And what she has found was quite profound. Despite the fact that the Egyptians have innovative medical practices, but they suffer from diseases as well. And the diet that they had, what Dr. Rosalind did it found, was that they consume a high animal fat diet, highly processed food, high sugar, high salt, and alcohol. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Absolutely. And what they discovered as well, that Ramses II of Egypt died of a massive heart attack. Heart disease. These, these were the diseases that existed in ancient Egypt. Heart disease, cancer, arthritis, obesity, high blood pressure, rheumatism, and sexually transmitted diseases as well. Are these the diseases that we see today? Yes. In the time of Exodus was a time of slavery of God's people in Egypt. They were subjected to physical torture, mental torture under the physical rule and the iron fist of the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And then these people, they were worshiping idols, they were eating what they want, and God's law were deemed obsolete. And they were subjected under the iron fist of the Pharaoh, but God was to do something. God chose one man and his name is Moses to deliver God's people out of Egypt. 
You know, there was been many arguments whether the 10 plagues ever existed. There was a lot of debate that was going on that whether Moses did part of the Red Sea and whether there was a lot of the, the plagues actually existed. But there was a, a, a pioneering study in 2010, and it was this professor, Augusto McGinney, he's a paleoclimatologist at Heidelberg University, and they concluded in 2010 that they found evidence of real natural disaster on which the 10 plagues of Egypt were based proving that the Bible, what Bible said was true. When God brought his people out of Egypt into the wilderness, God did three things. He gave, he constituted the law for his people. Why did he do that? Because when, we, when, when the people were in Egypt, they were brainwashed. They were in the culture. They were suffering, both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But God brought them out of Egypt, and He instituted the laws. And these are the three laws that God instituted. The moral laws, which are the Ten Commandments. The ceremonial laws, where they, where they have to confess their sin and slay a lamb. And also, health laws. And what is the role of the law? Can I ask you something? When God wrote the Ten Commandments, how did he write it? With his finger. There's only three instances in the Bible that I know that God used his hand. We know that he wrote the law with his finger in the Old Testament. Let's track back to Genesis. Let's go back before Exodus, way to Genesis. The Bible says, if you have the Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. What did the Bible say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now pay attention to this in verse 3. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke, and there was light. How many days did God create the heavens and the, the, our earth? In six days. And he rested on the seventh day. He spoke and he was created. He spoke and the sea was created. He spoke and the birds were created. He spoke and the fishes were created. When he came to the sixth day, he spoke and the animals were created. But when he created Adam, he fashioned him with his hands. He fashioned him with his hands. He wrote the law with his finger. So God deemed us so important that he fashioned us in his hand. He could have spoke, but he used his hands. The law is the knowledge of sin, is the measuring stick. You know, in today's, we are so immersed in our culture with Instagram and Facebook and different kinds of social media, and sometimes we use that as a measuring stick. But God is calling us and tell us there's a measuring stick that God calls to us. That is His law. Because by His law, we know whether we have sin. The law reveals our need for our Savior, for God. But if you do with, away the law, there's no sin. That means you, can't, you can do anything you want, but that's not what it is. And God taught the Egypt the, the people of the Egyptians that God has brought up Egypt, that there is something called the law. And it says, I would not have known sin except through the law. And Paul know, knows that when he wrote in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. There was another law, which was the ceremonial laws. What was the ceremonial laws? If you know that you have sinned, and God says that because of you had transgressed against me and you have sinned, God gave a solution. In Romans says, for the wages of sin is death. But God is not going to kill his people. He gave them away by 
this, by putting the hand onto a lamb, confessing your sin and transferring sin to the lamb, and you are forgiven. And we know now that Jesus was the lamb and the ceremonial laws has been done away. And the health laws, what's the purpose of the health law? The people, the God's people in Egypt has been indulged with, with all kinds of food that the Egyptians and the Pharaoh indulged and God was, so God was set his people straight for three reasons, to preserve their lives, to prevent diseases, and to have their life living more abundantly. In the early 1940s, there was a Hungarian physician by the name of Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis. He was working in a Vienna General Hospital. And general, in that general hospital, there, he was working in the obstetrics ward. And there was a lot of women delivering babies, were having babies, and there were a lot of doctors helping out in delivering the babies. But there was a problem. Out of every six women who deliver baby, one would die. One would die. Every one in six. And Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis was scratching his head and said, why are these women dying? And he took him three years because what will happen is that when they give birth and the women will fall sick, they'll have fever for several days and then they will die. And the doctors will bring the women into the, into the morgue and they'll perform autopsy on these women. And after performing the autopsy of the women, the doctors will then go into the obstetrics ward and deliver the babies. And he saw that pattern. And what he did was he told the doctors, let's do something. And it was radical at that time. It was not radical today because it, it, doesn't, it makes sense to us that we're supposed to wash our hands. But for them, it was radical. He says that you, you, because you're going to the morgue, you bring the diseases back to the women. And he told the doctors to wash their hands. And the result was astounding. The mortality plummeted. And more women were saved. And that was renowned. But he was kicked out of the hospital because they thought that his way of doing things was radical. Because at that time, they, did not, they, they have no theories on viruses or bacteria. Because anything that you cannot see, they did not believe in it. But now we know through medical advances that viruses and bacteria exist. And through as simple as washing your hands can save lives. If you, those people who work in the medical profession, um, in the hospitals in Victoria, we have an infection control team, they're nurses, and they'll come to you telling doctors off who do not wash their hands from turning from patient to patient. And simple as washing hands alone can save lives, even till today. But where did that come from? It came from God. Three and a half thousand years before, before we even knew it, God knew that viruses and bacteria existed. And if the people in Vienna Hospital in the 1840s would have known that and read the Bible, they would have saved a lot of lives. The Bible tells us about saving lives. Let me bring you back to the middle of 14th century. There was a plague that went across all of Europe, from England to Germany to Hungary, wiping out one third of the population in Europe. At least 150 million people died. People were dying like plagues and it was spreading like wildfire and they had to carry dead bodies and burying them because they those people who carried the bodies, they themselves got infected and they died. There was one pastor that realized that he needed to do something. He needed to separate the healthy and the people who are sick. And by doing that, a lot of people were saved. And where did he get the idea from? Quarantine concept. Again, from the Bible. When God brought his people out of Egypt, there were people who were suffering from leprosy and God says those who suffer leprosy stay out of the camp. If we knew about quarantine during the time of the plague, would millions of lives would be saved? And I believe so. God gives us the law of 
clean and unclean food. And the laws about fat and blood that were not to be eaten. Let's explore a bit further. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 6 and 8. God says, Also the swine is unclean for you because it has cloven hooves, yet it does not chew the curd. And you shall not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses because the disease can jump. You know, um, yeah, I'm not sure whether pork would look very delicious right now with this picture. But um, there was a study was done by Dr. McNaught, and he was uh, an English uh, scientist that he went to the market and he started to buy pieces of pork and he started slicing them. At, at that time, microscope existed. So he's able to look under the microscope and find some of the things that he was shocked to find. And he, he started to find that one in every four pork specimens had living trachina lava in it. People, there are some people who eat pork when they are not cooked well and they can suffer from disease by, of trachina living, lava living in their bodies. Let me tell you a story. There was this young man in Melbourne that he, one day he started having fever and he thought it was just a normal fever. And he was, he was shaking, he was shivering and he waited one or two days and he thought that he would go away and he would take Panadol and Nurofen to try to calm the fever, but that went on for days. After, after one week, he started suffering pains in the joints. And by the second week, he started having swollen eyes. And he felt that there's something that's not right. He went to see GP after GP and GP. And he couldn't figure out what was going on. And one distinct thing that he was suffering was he was having this excruciating headaches. And he had tickling sensation of his arm and his fever would fluctuate up and down. He had no idea what was going on. And he sent him to the hospital in Melbourne and they decided to do a CT scan. And this is what they found. They found Trochina's lava chewing away his brain. And that was the symptoms that he was displaying. And it came from, from scientific evidence, it came from pork. And um, God told us three and a half thousand years ago that we should abstain from eating things that are unclean. Let me ask you a question. Has our physiology changed from three and a half thousand years ago? No. We still have the same stomach, the same intestine. Everything is pretty much still the same. But the thing is that there are certain foods that are not meant to be eaten. Then you say, look, someone actually approached me and say, if that, if pig is not to be eaten, then why did God create that pig? Did God create an elephant? Do we see elephant on our meals? Did God create a horse? Did God create a dog and cats? You don't see that on our meal. That because of the custom at that time that has passed, transcends through generations and generations, we have so accustomed to eating these kind of food, seeing on the menu that the abnormal becomes the normal. Well, we see a lot of things in this world right now, at this moment, that what was once abnormal 10 years ago is normal for us now. And you know that. And God went a bit further and said, look, there, there are things that you may eat of all that are in the waters, that you may eat all that has fins and scales, and whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat it. It shall be unclean for you. And um, again, one of the leading marine biologists by the name of Dr. Bruce Halstead, and um, he was um, basically commissioned by the Navy Army to do some research about the the food that can be eaten and what food should be avoided in the sea. Because what will happen is that what they're trying to say is that they are, they're going to send Navy SEALs out into war-torn countries. And if they got lost or they got separated from the team and they're going to survive, they want to make sure that when they come to rescue them, that they are alive. So they will be looking for food. So what are the foods that they should, should, they should avoid and what are the food they should, they should eat to keep them alive? And he did this study, and a lot of money has been poured into this research, and the conclusion is this, that food, that fish, fishes that don't have scales, shouldn't be eaten. And to avoid all kinds of shellfish because of the toxins that they possess. 
because it is unclean for you in Deuteronomy ch chapter 14 and verse 10. And that was his conclusion. Well, he could have paid me the money and I could show him the Bible and tell them that this is, this is what the Bible says. And why not shellfish? There's something very distinctive about shellfish. They have a very unique digestive system. That is, they do not filter off the toxins. That means whatever toxins that they ingest in shellfish, it retains in their body. And that's quite similar to pigs as well, because they do not perspire. And we know that high fat, animal fat diet tend to retain a lot of toxins in their body. And that's what shellfish does. And um, they, they, another, another thing is that they feed at the bottom. They are scavengers. They eat dead fishes, the dead skins of animals, and they, they basically ingest them, and the toxins retains within themselves. They are also a carrier for E. coli and hepatitis A as well, and some of you might know, and uh, salmonella. God says, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which has brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. God brought them out of Egypt and told them these three laws, that if you abide in me, I will put none of the diseases on you, for I am the Lord who heals you. And there was none feeble among the tribes, though for those people who abided in God and kept his commandment and his laws. Now I'm going to talk to you about the book of Daniel. There's something that we can learn in the book of Daniel. Because the book of Daniel speaks of Daniel and three of his friends about how they kept the diet that God has commanded. And let's, let's, let's turn to the book of Daniel. Let, before that, let me tell you about Daniel. Daniel and his Hebrew friends was brought away from Jerusalem and into Babylon. They were held captives by the king of Babylon as they invade the country of Jerusalem and they brought them to the city of Babylon. But before we even look at the, go further into the book of Daniel, there's a few things that you need to know. The book of Daniel is very interesting. It has 12 chapters, and it is a story from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 12, but it is also a book of prophecy. If we read Daniel as a story, we will miss the big picture. But if we read Daniel and read it as a prophecy, we will learn a lot of things that God's about to teach us. And book of Daniel, you have to remember one thing as well. There is a theme. There's a theme of good and evil. There's a theme of great controversy. If we miss that, we will miss the big picture as well. So just bear that in mind. Turn with me to chapter, the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1. So where is the book of Daniel? If you have your Bible with you, you just divide it into half, and it just will be slightly after over the half part of the book of Daniel. Okay, so book of Daniel is after the book of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel. Chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible tells us, In the third year of reign, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So it tells us in the third year of reign of king of Judah, the king of Babylon's name is Nebuchadnezzar, and he came to J Jerusalem and besieged it. You need to understand these things. It's Jerusalem at that time symbolizes, in the Bible, Jerusalem symbolizes righteousness. Jerusalem symbolizes God people. Jerusalem symbolizes righteousness. But Babylon symbolizes confusion. Babylon symbolizes the things of the world. Now, verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, and some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and brought the articles of treasure, house of his God. In Daniel 1, chapter 3, the king instructed Ashpenaz, which was the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Verse 4 says, The young men in whom they, there was no blemish, but good-looking, 
gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve the king's palace, in whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And when they were delivered from Jerusalem into Babylon, the king appointed a feast for them. Verse 5 says, The king appointed forth a daily provisions of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank for three years of training for them, so at the end of that time they might serve the king. So there's a purpose. King Nebuchadnezzar was a, was a great king, and he was, a, he was a, uh, a king that has an iron fist, just like the pharaoh. And when he delivered the people from, from Jerusalem into Babylon, he was preparing to train them, to give them all the food, everything that they can to educate them so that they can send them back into Jerusalem to reign. And this is not an uncommon thing because when we know in the, in the, in the war in Russia and Afghanistan, they did the same thing as well. They brought the people who are wise from Afghanistan into Russia, they trained them, teach them the languages and send them back. And this was the time that Nebuchadnezzar had the plan to do that. And among them were four Hebrew boys from Judah. Their name was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. He gave, he started to change their names. They tried to change their names to brainwash them. They gave them Daniel, Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, and Abednego. Just a bit of rundown about changing names. When God, when, when Daniel's name, it's, it stands for God is my judge. And Hananiah, Yahweh, is God. Mishael, who's, who belongs to God, and Azariah, God is my helper. But when Nebuchadnezzar brought them into Babylon, they decided to change their name. Daniel's name has been changed to the keeper of the hidden treasures of Bel. Bel is the god of Babylon, Bel Maduk. They worship him at that time. And Hananiah's change was inspiration of the sun because they were sun worshippers. And Meshach was changed of the goddess of Shekha, they worshipped the moon. And, and Azariah's name was changed to Abednego, the servant of the shining fire. I would just like to pause for a moment here and basically reflect upon what's going on. You know, we can't help but to really observe that sometimes we feel that we are living in a time of Babylon. The things that we see these days are brainwashing our society, are brainwashing our culture. We are a very confused bunch of people. And when we talk about health, can you imagine how many diets are there when you, when you Google on the internet and you Google, what's the best diet for me? You'll probably see paleo diet, 5-2 diet, Atkins diet, Mediterranean diet, plant-based diet, I could go on and go on. And that is the, which one is the best diet? Do you know something? At, when Atkins promote his diet, he says that you should eat lots of meat and little carbs. At, in his 50s, he died of his own diet. You know, we need to seek what is the diet? What is the true diet for us? And we, there's a lot of brainwashing in this world today, and we need to be clear what is happening to our world today. And um, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, they were given the diet of the king. They were given the wine that the king drank. But Daniel did something. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself from the portion of the king's delicacy, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuch that he might not defile himself. So he says, Daniel says, I'm not going to eat whatever the king eats because God says those are the food that's not good for me. And he told Ashpenaz that he's not going to touch it. And now God has brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of eunuchs. We see that he purposed in his heart. And what Daniel said was pretty remarkable. He started to ask them to test. Test your servants for 10 days. Just give us only vegetables and water to drink. And let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portions of the king's delicacies as you will see fit with your servants. And that was a, one of the first research tests that's been done in the Bible. Genesis in chapter 1 verse 29 says, And God says, Seize, I've given you every herb that yields seeds, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seeds, to you it shall be for food. 
You know, I recently attended the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, and there was a speaker from Sydney who was very profound. It was investigating about Alzheimer's disease and whether there is a possibility of reversing it. You know, and what they found was that there was a significant evidence that indicates that consumption of the plant-based diet facilitates the healthy brain aging and prevents neurodegenerative diseases. You know, food can be divided right smack down into half. Food that causes inflammation and food that doesn't. And what we know that food that causes inflammation are the food of the diet of the Egyptians. That food that doesn't cause inflammation is what the Bible says, mainly the plant-based diet. And this was quite profound. And a lot of people who were there was very awestruck about, about this. It sounds simple, but a lot of research has been channeled into this to come with this conclusion. And there is also another research that came in and says that in the present review, we concluded that even consumption on light and moderate doses of alcohol leads to shrinkage of the brain. You know, Daniel purpose in his heart that he's not going to defile himself by drinking the alcohol that the kings drink. And it says that these changes in brain parameters are negatively co correlated with cognitive, cognitive performance. You know, there's been a lot of studies through animals. And in Australia, there was a spearhead study done in just last year. Um, a four-day Western-style dietary intervention causes reduction in hippocampal dependent learning and memory and interoceptive sensitivity. What does this mean? So what they did was they took a, a bunch of people and they put them onto a diet, a Western diet, and they start to assess them in their cognitive behavior. They start to assess their hi hippocampus. It's part of a limbic system deep-seated in our brain that has got to do with long-term memory. And what they did was they got them to remember certain things at the start. And then after the four days, they get to do a various different kind of complicated task. And what they found was after four days, that this is the first experimental evidence in humans that a brief, only four days, manipulation of saturated fat and added sugar intake leads to poorer performance on tests known to be hippocampally related. You know, how do you want your children to be? You want them to excel in everything that they do. But just in four days that this could affect their memory and performance, intellectual performance. And Daniel says, at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better, fatter in flesh, than all the young men who ate the portions of king's delicacies. Another study that was done was a 21-day Daniel fast on metabolic and cardiovascular risk factors in men and women. They took 43 subjects, they divided it into two, and it says that, look, you will have a plant-based diet, absolutely no meat and sugar. And the other group, you basically continue with your Western diet. And these people, they have parameters, they took their blood pressure, they took their blood test, they took their cholesterol, and they measured them up after 21 days. And this is what they found. In 21 days, people who have high cholesterol, they, they were decreased by 18%. Their bad cholesterol, the LDL, reduced by, by 23%. And the blood pressure dropped by 10%, the diastolic blood pressure dropped by 5 it is amazing. Again, now again, in the GP, we, we, we routinely give people statins. And there's nothing wrong with giving statins. If their blood pressure is high, their risk is high, you, and while, while that is being addressed, we need to address their lifestyle factors. I'll tell you a brief story about a gentleman that came to me not too long ago, probably about a month ago. He was from Indonesia, and he came, and he had, he, he had been having headaches for the past two months. He has becoming sluggish. He couldn't. He couldn't. Pay, he, he just couldn't function. He he has a very very high strong job, and he works seven days a week. And he needed to function well. And his wife felt that he was deteriorating in his health. And he brought him and come and see me. And I saw him and I took his blood pressure. He didn't look well at all. At all, he was overweight and he was. He looks. He looks like a mess. I took his blood pressure three times. It was 160 over over 120. And I was, he was dangerously high. And I said, look, you know, there's certain things that we, we need to do. And I told him, said, look, we need to start you on certain medication just to keep it a bit low because he's, he's high risk. And I, he, he told me, he said he didn't want to take medications at all. He said, no, nope, absolutely none. Okay, fine. Let's talk about certain things that we can do to you. And let's say, if I tell you what you need to do in the next one week, 
you need to come back and see me. He said, anything, you just tell me. I told him exactly what we did in the, in the Daniel fast. You take away all your meat, you take away your sugar, no fizzy drinks, no, nothing artificially that's gonna be in your diet. Go on the plant-based diet. I educated him about the balanced diet of having proteins and complex carbs and start exercising. One week later, he came to me. He's almost like a new person. Well, he didn't lose a lot of weight at that time, but he, he looks refreshed. He came in and says his headache was gone. He was drinking water every day. He started to do walking every day, and he did exactly what I said. I took his blood pressure only once. It was 129 over 80. One week. You know, and um, I have to take off his blood pressure medications. And he said he never felt like he never, he never felt like this for a long time. So this is evidence based. And God knows that what is good for us. And the book of Daniel tells us as these four young men, God gave them the knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all vision and dreams. And when the king brought them and interviewed them, you know what they found? None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served the king. God saved Daniel and his three Hebrew friends because they were loyal to God. And they were telling him, what the things that they must do to improve their health. And, in, and the Bible continues to say, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding in which the king examined them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were within this realm. Therefore, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. What have we learned today? You know, the Bible has a lot to teach us. Sometimes we do, we do not even know what we need, but he really knew it before we even understand what we need. If we were to hear the word of God during the death plague, during the 1840s when sanitation was, wasn't there, people, lives would be saved. A lot of times now we're living in a world where we need to evidence. Look, I have nothing with evidence. Evidence saves lives. Evidence-based medicine saves lives. But there are a lot of times when we start to see results within our realm, and particularly in my clinic, lives would have been saved if we do not wait for the true evidence to come out. But we, go, we know the Bible is true. What but the Bible says, because God wants us to live an abundant life, to have the physical health, the mental health, the spiritual health, and emotional health for our family. And um, we also know that there is a higher power that God is with us. And we also know that it's a struggle as well between good and evil, that there's always a struggle and we are gonna make choices every day. And uh, we've seen Daniel that he is, he is 10 times more wiser than all the astrologers. Now I'm gonna leave you with this. The button, Jesus tells us in John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill and this, to destroy but I've come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. God never wanted suffering in our life. That was never his intention. The diseases that come into our, our society is not the result of God. There is a great controversy. We have to make the choice what God wants us to make. And God, Jesus says when he came to give us life, to give us more abundantly. I'm gonna end my message here today. I hope that you've learned something, something that, that will impress upon your life. I know that some, some, we're not gonna change our lives 180 degrees today, but it gives us a background, a platform of knowledge, some, something we, that we can build on. If you think about your children, you think about the future, you think about things that you can do in your lives. You know, it's very easy to look back and say, I should have, I could have, I would have. And that, it's not something that I would want in any of my patients or any of you at all. I want to say, you to say to say, I knew, I've done, I've achieved, I've conquered. And that's the message. It's a message of 
truth, the message of courage, the message of faith, the message that God has given us that we can do something in our lives. Let's close, shall we, in the word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy. And thank you so much for caring for our health. Even the little things that matters in our life matter to you. Father, in this um, seminar, we're talking about healthy families for eternity. We think of families, we think of our children. These children are the pearls of heaven as much as these pearls on this earth. We want to raise healthy children in this world. Life is changing at a very fast pace. But Lord, how do we equip ourselves to prepare our family in the right way, according to the way that you've bestowed upon us? So Father, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson. And we thank you that we can come together, Lord, to acknowledge your word. We ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. This message was made available from Beyond Patmos. For more resources like this, visit beyondpatmos.org. questions or comments in relation to today's program, you can call 3ABN Australia Radio within Australia on 02 4973 3456 or from outside of Australia on country code 612 4973 3456. Our email address is radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. That is radio at the number 3 ABN Australia, all one word, dot org dot au. Our postal address is 3 ABN Australia Inc, PO Box 752, Morissette, New South Wales 2264 Australia. Thank you for your prayers and financial support. Guide them 
along the path, the narrow way. Oh Lord, bless the little children as they grow from day to day. No longer should we sit back and neglect their given role to each of us with child is given the saving of our soul as parents with their children now let's reach for heaven's land pray lord bless the little children as they grow and hold your What's the purpose of the Bible? Some will be quick to say, it's God's Word for us. And while that's a good answer, that's not really the purpose of the Bible. To answer this question, let's look at how the Bible explains it. Jesus tells us in John chapter 5, verse 39, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So Jesus' answer to the question is, the purpose of the Bible is to testify or provide a testimony of Himself. Now, what's really interesting is that this word testify in the original Greek language is the same word as the English word for martyr, which gives us the idea that the Scriptures are given to bear record as a witness or as a martyr of Jesus Christ. So in a way, the Bible is just like having a living, breathing witness whose job is to give an account of what it has seen and heard. Maybe this is why John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Now, to understand how the Bible is a witness to Jesus, let's look at what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. Speaking to Timothy, Paul writes, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul continues, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's take a moment now to explore these four reasons or functions of Scripture that Paul gives us. The first is doctrine. The word doctrine is the Greek word for teaching. So the idea is that the Word of God is for teaching. So how does doctrine reveal or testify of Jesus? Well, doctrines provide the framework for revealing or testifying of Jesus. For example, 
doctrines testify of Jesus in regards to salvation or sin, death, heaven, hell, baptism, holiness, creation, social justice, hospitality and addiction. Without doctrine, we would never know what Jesus was like and what he stood for or what he was against. The next thing Paul mentions is the word reprove. The scriptures are given to reprove us. The word reprove is the idea of calling out someone's intentional wrong actions. So how is being reproved connected to the testifying of Jesus? Well, reproving is necessary to show and remind us when we are directly contradictory to the very character of Jesus. Thirdly, Paul says that scriptures are for correction. And the word correction is the idea of pointing out someone's unintentional or wrong actions. How is correction then different to reproving? The correction is in the case when someone doesn't know what they are doing is wrong. While reproving is for the case where someone is intentionally doing the wrong. And lastly, Paul's reason for the scriptures is that is it instruction in righteousness. This is another way of saying it shows us all the right in the universe. It helps us understand the genuine character of Jesus so that the counterfeit is easily seen. So now that we know that the Bible's purpose is to reveal Jesus, and this happens by giving us doctrine, by reproving us, by correcting us and instructing us, what's the point of knowing Jesus so intimately? The ultimate goal of the Bible is to transform us into a complete man or woman of God. Now, what is the definition of what this completeness looks like? In verse 17, Paul tells us that a complete person is one that is transformed into a man or woman of God and is equipped to perform good works. But what does the word equipped mean? Well, equipped is about being supplied with something, meaning you don't start out with it. But after being equipped with it, now you have it. And what are we being equipped with in this verse? Good works. That's what's being supplied to us. We didn't start out with them, but after we're supplied with them, we have good works. So here's the summary in case you missed it. The Bible is given to reveal Jesus and to provide a framework on how to be transformed into His image. It does this through four channels. First, it teaches us about Jesus through a thing called doctrine. Second, it rebukes us or reproves us when we're intentionally going opposite to the character of Christ. And then thirdly, it gently corrects us when we're unintentionally going off in a different direction to the character of Jesus. And lastly, it teaches us everything that Christ is through instruction in righteousness. All of this is designed to transform us into men and women of God. Have a blessed day. It's been our pleasure bringing you this program today here on 3ABN Australia Radio. 